The FBI, the CIA, and the NSA are all using RFID technology to catch criminals, terrorists, and to prevent espionage. In this special edition of the RFID Network, we're in Washington, D.C. to understand how RFID is being used for covert operations. Stay tuned. Forget everything you think you know about RFID. If you want to track something or someone without their knowledge, then you need to understand how RFID and other wireless technologies really work. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. Anything that communicates using radio waves needs to be able to identify and differentiate itself from other things. The first use of RFID was in the 1940s to identify and differentiate military aircraft. It's what allowed the Allies to determine which plane was a friend and which one was not. Today, RFID is still used by the military as well as commercial airplanes. RFID is also used by countless other things. The keys to open your car door. The automatic payment passes used in toll booths. Building access systems passports, payment cards, and even student ID cards, wireless sensors and mesh networks, laptop and tablet computers, as well as music players and other devices that connect to wireless networks use a unique identifier called the Media Access Control MAC address. Bluetooth devices such as headsets for your mobile phone also use this method for wireless identification. The EAS or Electronic Article Surveillance tags you see on clothes and retail stores are not RFID, even though the word surveillance implies that they are. EAS tags don't uniquely identify an item. They only identify if the item it is attached to has been paid for or not. But the most common device that uses radio frequency identification is your mobile phone. The International Mobile Equipment Identity, or IMEI, uniquely identifies a specific mobile phone being used on a mobile network. In fact, this mobile phone uses three different radio frequency identifiers, an IMEI and two MAC addresses for both network and Bluetooth communication. As you can see, there are many different types of devices that identify themselves using radio communication, and it's easy to get them confused. There's no need to be concerned if you don't understand the differences. Just remember that RFID only provides a unique wireless identification for objects. It serves as the conduit between the physical world and the digital world because it allows physical objects to be identified and differentiated by computers. Without these different kinds of RFID, there could be no wireless networks because there would be no way to know the difference between two different wirelessly connected objects. What people are concerned about is being tracked without their knowledge, and there are a number of different ways to do that. Coming up next on the RFID Network, ways you can be tracked without your knowledge, using RFID for covert surveillance, and can thieves really inventory what's inside a building? Stay tuned. If you'd like to learn more facts about RFID technology, please visit the RFID Network website at RFID.net. Just like any conversation, RF communication requires a transmitter and a receiver. Louder signals tend to be closer, while quieter signals farther away. This is the principle behind the first method of wireless location and tracking, measuring signal strength. Your mobile phone is a sophisticated two-way radio that uses a low-power transmitter to communicate with radio receivers on towers arranged in a network of cells. 
By measuring how loud an RF signal is, it's possible to determine the approximate distance between the transmitter and the receiver. Only there are a number of challenges. Buildings, trees, and even people cause interference that degrades the signal strength, so even if the transmitter is close to the receiver, a signal can be weak. Plus, RF signals reflect off of other objects and bounce around. RF receivers hear the primary signal and the reflections, just like people hear echoes in a cave. It becomes even more difficult for the receiver when there are a lot of transmitters communicating at the same time. The receiver has to try to hear the weak signals over the strong ones. In order to overcome these challenges, engineers started measuring the time it takes for the RF signal to travel between objects. This is the second method used for wireless location and tracking, measuring signal travel time. However, neither of these methods overcome our next challenge, the fact that radio waves don't travel in a straight line. So even if the signal strength and the travel time are known, the signal could have come from a number of different locations. Given these challenges, an approximate location can still be determined. Since every cell tower receiver has a known or fixed position, by measuring both the time and the signal strength of the RF signal when it reaches a cell phone tower, the approximate location of the phone can be determined. It's obvious when you look at this map. The circle shows the approximate accuracy of the phone's location. Newer mobile devices have a built-in global positioning system, or GPS receiver. GPS receivers also use radio waves, but instead of using towers on the ground, they use satellites orbiting the Earth. To determine the location, the GPS receiver must be able to receive the signal from at least three of the 27 satellites, which typically requires a clear view of the sky. The more satellites, the more accurate the position. If you're inside or under trees, GPS doesn't work very well. Since the mobile phone carriers record the IMEI number, the cell tower it's connected to, along with the date, time, and other information, they know roughly where your cell phone has been. So if you don't want to be tracked, turn off your mobile phone. Coming up next on the RFID Network, using RFID for covert surveillance, using RFID in high security facilities, and can RFID tags be tracked by satellite? Stay tuned. This is an RFID chip. The media have sensationalized these devices by calling them spy chips and have even gone as far as claiming Big Brother is going to track you with them. RFID chips like these don't work like mobile phones because they don't transmit. They can't because they don't have their own source of power. Passive RFID chips harness energy from nearby radio transmitters, most often from a device commonly referred to as an RFID reader. Not having their own power source allows RFID chips to be small, but it also limits the distance that they operate. There's another limiting factor. In order for an RFID chip to work, it needs an antenna, which makes it larger. By combining an RFID chip with an antenna, you create something called an RFID tag. There are a lot of different kinds of RFID tags designed for all different applications. There are even RFID tags with batteries, but that makes the tag even larger. Passive RFID tags only work when they come within range of an RFID reader, and there are a lot of factors that determine the distance. Power, frequency, antenna size, antenna pattern, equipment sensitivity, and all the other challenges we spoke of earlier determine the range of operation. Just to give you an idea, for more than 10 years, RFID network engineers have tested hundreds of different RFID tags and thousands of different scenarios and published the results on our website. What we found is that even the best performing battery assisted RFID tags can only operate about a baseball field away. So even though they don't operate as far away as your cell phone, they can still be used for covert tracking. I'm with Carl Brown with Simply RFID. Carl, thank you for agreeing to be in the RFID network today. Thanks, Lou. So, Carl, tell us what you can about how you are working with government agencies to use RFID technology for covert tracking of assets and other things. Okay. Well, yeah, when we talked about this, we, we, you know, I thought about what are we doing the most frequently. And, and I thought about not just government, but it's really commercial and government. And 
people want to know where their stuff is. Um, so I brought along a laptop today to kind of show you what we're doing with laptops specifically that, that makes sense. Um, today, you're going to track all your corporate assets. And more than likely, you're going to put something like this, a little barcode on your asset. It's going to have an ID that's going to show you what is it. And I could put a couple of labels in front of you here. I want to show you this tag. This is actually an RFID tag that we placed on this laptop. Now, this is a pretty overt tag. I mean, you know, it's right there in front of you. Anybody can say, hey, you know, I'm just going to peel this tag off. So the next thing you say is, okay, well, how do I get it off? Actually, it's not that easy to get it off. But the next thing you go to is a slightly bigger tag. And this tag over here in front of you is our, our TM9LR. What's nice about this tag is it's very, very durable. And we found that with super glue, you place this on the outside of the asset, and it's, it's almost, you can't remove the thing. So once it's actually on there, the only way you can really get it off is with a screwdriver and a hammer. And that creates quite a mess in the office and in your, in your building. So it's still pretty overt, and people are still going to do it. And they're still going to try and uh, get these, these tags off of the, the outlet top. So the covert aspect comes in. And so for every installation we do, we recommend an overt and a covert solution. Whether or not you're commercial or government, you have to have both. Because the criminals are going to be expecting those types of solutions. So what we do is we tag this laptop in about five locations that we're going to tell you about today. And there's a couple more that we won't tell you about. Um, inside of the battery compartment is one of the tags. Uh, there's the, the battery itself is not tagged. However, there's a small tag hidden inside of the battery compartment mm. that we're catching. Inside of the removable floppy drive, there's also a tag. Uh, right up inside of here, we have a tag there. So for each one of these locations, you, you need to find it. We also place it over here inside the memory module area and inside the hard drive area. So each of these areas are currently tagged. We're now working with manufacturers to actually tag these things in the motherboard. So when you purchase the item right from the manufacturer, it's going to come pre-tagged to you. So it's going to be next to impossible. But the key is, is that we tell them about the external, we show them the overt RFID tag, and then we tag it secretly elsewhere. The point really is, is that in order to catch someone in the act, you have to tag it in some way they're not going to know about. There's one more tag I didn't tell you about. Coming up next on the RFID Network, more covert surveillance using RFID and high security facilities. And can RFID tags be tracked by satellite? Stay tuned. You can show everyone how much you like the RFID Network. You can find us on Facebook at RFID.net slash FB. The key is, is that we tell them about the external, we show them the overt RFID tag, and then we tag it secretly elsewhere. The point really is, is that in order to catch someone in the act, you have to tag it in some way they're not going to know about. There's one more tag I didn't tell you about, and it's actually in the LCD panel itself. We've actually taken the top off, placed it inside there. The only way to get in there is with specialized tools to actually open up and close the, the laptop again. So on this laptop you have one, two, and then probably three overt tags, and then you have five covert RFID tags in there, mm -hmm. and possibly even more. So that tells you where the laptop is at mm -hmm. any given time within the facility, right. but how do you know who's taking it, who's removing it, how do you mm -hmm. associate it with the thief? Yeah, that's, no, that's great, and that's the one thing about RFID. If you haven't really followed RFID, um, these tags themselves, now, very inexpensive tag. This tag runs for about 20 cents a tag for this RFID tag. Uh, these larger tags are going to cost you closer to 3 or $4 a tag. But the key is, is that they're both the same technology, but they can read from up to 100 feet away. This tag, 40 feet. This tag, about 60 feet. But there's, there's a couple tags in the market that are close to 100 feet read range now. And when they go out a doorway, we have sensors placed there. And a little later on, we'll just go look at some of these sensors and show you what they look like, I hope. Uh, that will actually demonstrate how the laptop went out the door. In fact, not just the laptop, anything in your bag that's tagged is now going to be indexed as going out the door at the same time, and we integrate that with video. Mm. So the actual video event of you going out the door at that time and date is indexed in the RFID. Search on my name, you'll see all my video events. So I don't need to be wearing an RFID-enabled badge. It doesn't matter. You know the asset's leaving, and there's a video. So that's great. I'm out the door. I could be long gone. How is security uh, alerted that there's something leaving that shouldn't be? 
The, and there's a couple ways we can do that. One is, is that we can send SMS, we can send emails, we can send pictures of who's going out the door. Mm. Um, it's actually a multi-part system. So when we do a system for somebody, we also, also get, often get this question. And it's, it's a question of, well, booster bag, for instance. Booster bag is one of the number one search terms on our website. People are always looking at ways, how can I throw a laptop or an item from Walmart or Target into a bag and steal it? What is a booster bag? A booster bag, and great, great question, Lynn. A booster bag is an aluminum or metal lined bag. And they'll, take, mm. they'll actually manufacture a duffel bag or a backpack or a purse, and they'll put metal inside of it with aluminum. And they drop an item inside, they close the top, and it's impervious to RF. You cannot read into that bag. Um, and you've actually seen some of these wallets on TV now that shield your, your goods from uh, our... Supposedly. Safe, yeah. Supposedly shield your goods. Um, same, same technology, and it just shuts down the RFID. With RFID, there's no, there's no stopping. If you've ever been to a, a Walmart or a distribution center, you have to open a bag. You have to have an open bag policy. So RFID alone is not a solution to everything, mm. but it will solve a lot of problems, and it makes the checkout a lot faster for the... So let's say I decide to be tricky. I'm an employee and I get myself a booster bag, and I put a laptop in there, only I'm not going out the front door, I throw it in the trash can mm. or the dumpster. Yeah. Does that beat the system? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. You're, you're thief level 101. That's the, first, <laughs> uh, that's the first sign of a good thief. Um, it's the most common way to steal is by using the uh, cleaning personnel. They'll take the, as they're coming through at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., they throw items into the dumpster, into their bins, then they're carried out by the cleaning staff and tossed in the trash can, unknowing to them. Then at midnight or 1 a.m. you come and take the stuff out of the dumpster. The most common place we tag and check for tags is in the dumpster. Wow. And it's one of the number one places that we find goods being stolen. Wow. I had no idea. <laughs> so are, how are businesses benefiting from the use of this, as well as government agencies, from the use of RFID technology? Is it actually working and catching thieves? It's, it definitely works. The, um, and it's kind of funny because we had that, the question is, does it work? And the answer is, is that there have been no thefts. Anytime we've installed a system, there are no thefts after we install the system. So does it work? Yes, <laughs> because there are <laughs> no thefts. Um, once people realize what's going on, they, they really they, they stop trying to steal from those locations. And that, it's partly because of the, front, the obvious nature of it. Uh, in fact, a lot of times you'll see the overt doorway sensors when people walk out the front door, and those aren't actually really the turnstile areas. The areas that they're actually monitoring are elsewhere in the store. They're not mm. showing you that, and so that's where they stop theft much earlier. But yes, it absolutely works, and they've actually taken cases to court over it. The government has. Commercial, typically, they just stop the uh, mm. acts. Wow. Well, Carl, thank you so much for sharing what you can about using RFID for covert surveillance. Definitely. Thanks, Lou. Oh, Carl, what about this one right here? So this, you got RFID at this doorway. How does RFID help you to catch criminals here? Lou, this reader isn't even hooked up. <laughs> really? Really, really. Fantastic, nice and small, but the fact is is that typically we're going to install them in the ceilings, we're going to install them in uh, above doorways or underneath desks. So people think there's RFID in there, but there really isn't. Exactly, exactly. Wow. I yeah. had no idea. Yeah. All right. All right, let's go take a look. I'll show you. As Carl mentioned, the RFID-enabled security system uses video surveillance cameras mounted in obvious locations as well as others in hidden locations. I was surprised to learn that security personnel no longer need to sit and watch the video monitors. The RFID tags provide a far superior means of triggering alerts. A tag read in a particular location automatically triggers video recording and sends an instant alert to the security personnel's mobile devices. By combining high-resolution video and RFID for identification and wireless location, security officers can see theft as it happens, even if the stolen object is inside a briefcase, under a jacket, or stuffed inside a sock. The undisputed fact is that using RFID for covert tracking catches thieves and does so at a fraction of the cost of traditional security solutions. Even though it's not commercially available, the technology exists to put an antenna directly on an RFID chip and read them from a short range. In a high security facility, antennas can be embedded directly in the floor. RFID chips can be sprinkled on the floor. Since they're small, it's very difficult to see them. People unknowingly pick up the chip on their shoes 
and this allows the person's movement to be tracked around the facility without the person ever knowing he or she is being tracked. I'm with Dr. Dan Dobkin. Dr. Dobkin holds a PhD in physics from Stanford and he's also the author of The RF in RFID. Dr. Dobkin, welcome to the RFID Network. Thank you, Lewis. So, Dr. Dobkin, if I want to track someone from satellite using a passive RFID tag, is it really possible to do that? Okay, so first of all, we need to specify we're talking about passive RFID tags. These are the ones that you see on groceries, maybe on your luggage. They don't have a battery. They have no power source inside of them. They have to be powered by the reader, and that's the challenge. If you wanted to power such a tag from a satellite and talk to it, have it talk back to you and hear it, you have the same problem any radio has, and it's conceptually similar to the problem that we have when we talk to each other. That is, there are four basic factors, not including the intelligence of the talker and listener, that influence whether you can hear someone talking and understand them. They are, first of all, we'll use this microphone, how loud I speak. If I speak loudly, it's easy. And if I speak quietly, it can be difficult. For the microphone to pick up what I'm saying and the listener to decipher it. Secondly, how far away I'm influences the sound that's heard by the microphone. It gets loud here and it gets softer as the distance between the transmitter and receiver increases. Thirdly, and this is something a little less familiar in speech, but it is used, if you have a directional antenna, a means of not creating more sound energy, but merely putting it where you want it, you're louder if you're pointed in the right direction, and not as loud if you're pointed in the wrong direction. And then finally, the sensitivity of the microphone or the listener matters. If I cover up the microphone, it's less sensitive. So with those four factors in mind, let's think about what you need to power up this tag sitting on the top of somebody's head undetected. <laughs> I wouldn't notice. Um, with a satellite. So the satellite, let's say, is orbiting about 300 kilometers in the air, 180 miles. At 300 miles up, it turns out that you need about 300,000 watts of transmit power maybe a million if you use a smaller antenna. You need an antenna that's somewhere between 30 feet across and maybe 50 or 60 feet across. And then you can deliver enough power on the ground to turn the tag on. Then you need to hear the tag. The tag comes in at about a millionth of a billionth of a watt. While right next to you, if you're trying to do this on one satellite, there's a million watts. So if you want to get an idea of how this is, you picture yourself at a rock concert, the really loud ones, the kind that I don't go to, and you're sitting in front of the speakers and you're trying to hear a mosquito, right? So you got all that, you got that picture in your head, not even close. You have to be in a nuclear explosion trying to hear a mosquito. Wow. So there's no way that you could do this passive tag read with one satellite. You'd have two satellites way far separated, both with big expensive antennas, but only one with an insanely expensive transmitter. And the other one would be listening. And with all those provisos, you could actually hear the signal from the tag, if it wasn't swapped out by a bunch of other signals. Um, and you could decipher it. The challenges of doing that are substantial. In order to put it in perspective, the International Space Station, which is the largest, most expensive orbiting object so far created, has about 100,000 watts of total power available to it. So we have something like 600,000, 700,000, a million watts we have to deliver. We have to cool the thing off because you're putting a million watts into it and it has to go somewhere. Um, and we need a much bigger antenna than the current space station has. It has a two-meter, six-foot antenna for transmitting KU band signals. And we would need an antenna almost as big as a house. So you would be spending hundreds of billions of dollars 
to accomplish what you could accomplish by buying a reader for a couple hundred bucks, sticking it on a street corner, and wiring it up with Wi-Fi. It's the craziest thing I could ever imagine anyone wanting to do to infringe on your privacy. There are much, much better ways to keep track of what citizens are doing if that's what the government wants to do. And even if it did read the tag, what information did that just give them? Exactly. If this is, after all, a tag stuck on a bicycle, it said, you've got a bike, which anybody could see as you walked out of Walmart or Target or wherever the bicycle was tagged. And there's no location information, so you hear it from satellite that there's a bicycle, but you don't know where that bicycle is. Right. In fact, it's a little bit worse than that because a subtlety involved in trying to do this particular thing is that all these tags are EPC Global Gen 2, ISO 18000-6C. And they expect that after a reader turns them on, they talk back to the reader and give it a random number. And they want to hear that random number acknowledged within 10 microseconds. And it takes a heck of a lot longer than 10 microseconds for a signal to go up to a satellite. So, so the only way you could do this is to send an inquiry down and then 10 microseconds later send a random number and one out of every 64,000 tags responding will have that random number and you'll get it right and they'll talk back to you but you have no idea which tag you addressed and where it was and you can't get it repeatably. You won't be able to read it the second time. You'll read some other random tag. So it's so not doing any... It's, it's really, really hard and really, really silly, yes. Dr. Dam Dobkin is the author of The RF and RFID. Dr. Dobkin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Lewis. Here we are, inside an RFID-enabled van, where I'm attempting to read RFID tags inside the building. We have a full one-watt reader connected to antennas that are mounted on the outside of the van. This allows me to get the maximum power I possibly can get. All of the RFID tags inside the building are positioned in places where they should be easily readable. So far, I've not picked up a single tag. See, the building properties, both the concrete and the metal, they reflect and absorb the RF waves coming from the antenna, making it a very, very challenging environment to try to read in. The fact is any wireless signal can be tracked by measuring the signal travel time and the signal strength from one or more receivers. It's just a matter of how far and how accurately it can be done. Your mobile phone can be tracked by using the receivers on cell towers. Your laptop computer and music player can be tracked by using wireless access points in known positions. And RFID tags can be tracked by readers in the floors, ceilings, and walls. But before you get concerned, remember that the distance and accuracy of tracking is very limited. It's so limited, authorities rely on the GPS location information from your mobile phone when responding to 911 emergency calls. Passive RFID tags are not going to be tracked from satellites and thieves are not going to drive by and take an inventory of the items in your home or business. Most importantly, even if the RFID data is retrieved, it only provides a number, and that number typically doesn't mean anything all by itself. RFID is a tool that, when used responsibly, can benefit people in ways that are not only convenient, but save lives. The RFID network team travels the globe to demystify and demonstrate RFID applications and how they benefit people. Stay tuned. The RFID Network is sponsored in part by these companies.